sunshine Search my heart and know you will find It's love for you All I got is love for you all right, you're welcome to the show. Uh, drink is already poured. Uh, show is available Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays right here on YouTube, uh, 12, 20 hours Central African time. Amazing Minds, Zambia's first late night show. So Mondays are for political discussions. Wednesdays are for the educative segment, which includes history, the rebuttals, and uh, uh, educative discussions. We just had one the day before yesterday, which was Wednesday, we, we had a discussion on why it's important to be patriotic. And Fridays are for Bible Talks. If you guys watched last week's Bible Talks, uh, I had Reverend Mwambazi on the show, and we discussed the pre-Adamic world. Don't worry, this is not spiritual. It's not uh, blowing spiritually. <laughs> There's a fun. Yeah, anyway, so... Once again, you're welcome. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Hit that notification bell and share. Show is available Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays right here on YouTube. And you can catch the podcast uh, on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify for those that would find it more convenient to listen to, to audio podcasts. So today we are doing a part two of um, the doctrine of righteousness. Remember before I, I did the Bible Talks with Reverend Mambazi on the pre-Adamic world, I began a discussion on the doctrine of righteousness. And we talked about how the doctrine of, doctrine of righteousness is an elementary, it's an introductory teaching in the kingdom of God. So many people do not understand the kingdom of God to be a kingdom. I've heard people say the kingdom of God is God's dominion, it's God's rulership, it's God's reign. Uh, while that may be true, the kingdom of God is actually a kingdom. It's a tangible kingdom that you can touch, feel, experience, uh, hear, see. It is a tangible experience. Remember that we talked about this uh, earlier on when we talked about prayer being a portal into the spirit realm. Oh, my goodness. The spirit. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about prayer being a portal into the spirit realm, and we talked about how there are two different realms of existence. There's the spirit realm and the natural realm. The natural realm is what we experience now. But what many of us have always assumed is that there's only God and the angels in heaven and us here, okay? So we, we really narrow that perspective down uh, to only two environments. But there's uh, different environments, you know, when you talk about the spiritual revelation or spiritual realm or uh, tearing of the veil in two different realms of existence. Uh, scientists will tell you of things like black holes where you can, anyway, let's not get into that. But what I'm trying to say is the kingdom of God is a tangible kingdom, just as you would imagine any other kingdom. As a matter of fact, the earth itself is a kingdom. A kingdom with kingdoms in it. So the earth as a whole is a kingdom. And if you imagine heaven, imagine heaven like the kingdom of earth. So the kingdom of God is like the kingdom of earth, except it's a different kingdom with different material and different, different raw materials. Okay? That's about the kingdom of God. So once again, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Hit that notification bell and share. Jesus said something very interesting. He said... Um, Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he later on said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there are two things he said there. See the kingdom, enter the kingdom. You see, in order to see, sight is perception. It's talking about your sensory perception. You being aware, you being conscious of this environment called the kingdom. Unless you're born again, you can't be conscious of God's kingdom. God's kingdom exists, but you can only see it if you're born again. You can only be conscious of it. You can only experience God's kingdom when you're born again. And being born again uh, means you have become a citizen of two kingdoms. While you exist in the kingdom of earth, you exist in the kingdom of God, or what we may refer to as the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is where God's will is perfectly executed. So imagine a world with God's will fully and perfectly executed. That means there's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no... Everything flows as it should naturally flow. Every flower has life and every uh, everything is as it should be. You understand? Now, 
once you graduate into the kingdom, the book of Colossians says, uh, giving thanks unto God who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks unto God who has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So there is a kingdom we have been translated into. Now, once we enter this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, there is an elementary teaching we need to, an elementary doctrine we need to learn and understand before we can begin to actually experience the kingdom. If we don't understand this, it hinders us from every other progress we could have ever made in this kingdom. I hope you're following. What this means is that when you enter into the kingdom of God, there are principles by which you must live, things you must exercise and practice in order to fully experience and perceive and benefit from this kingdom. I'll give you some of the benefits that are in the kingdom of God. For example, he says, does he not make his angels ministering spirits unto the heirs of salvation? He makes his ministers flames of fire and his angels winds, right? All these are for our benefit. So how much of the angelic are you experiencing since you entered the kingdom of heaven? And we had this discussion, uh, a couple of friends and mine, a couple of friends of mine and I rather, uh, not too long ago, talking about how the early church experienced the angelic like it was, the, the, the veil was torn. You know, they experienced the angelic like they would experience people because angels came on a frequent basis. Remember when they were looking up uh, at Jesus' ascension, when he went up in a cloud and when they looked down, they found angels. The angels had to tell them, hey, why is you looking up? Jesus has gone. This same Jesus you saw go like this will come back. They were not amazed by seeing the angels. Angels were a daily thing. You know, when Peter was in prison and the angels came and the, and the, and the angel released him from prison, when he knocked at the door, they said, ah, it's his angel. So angels were a, you know, it was, it was normal for them to experience the angelic realm because they had bypassed a certain stage, which many believers today have not bypassed. Now, the doctrine of righteousness, the Bible in the book of Hebrews, I, I, I read this scripture to you in part one. The Bible in the book of Hebrews says, now spiritual milk belongs to babies, those who are unskillful in the doctrine of righteousness. But spiritual meat belongs to those who are mature. Strong meat belongs to those who are mature, who by reason of use have exercised their senses. Now, these senses, remember Jesus' words. He says, unless a man be born again, he cannot see. What do you use to see? There's a sense that you use to see, right? So what are these senses being referred to in the book of Hebrews? Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, by reason of use, uh, who have exercised their senses by reason of use to discern good and evil. Okay, now let's get into, let me break it down for you guys. The doctrine of righteousness is understanding the legalities of the kingdom of God as it concerns us and Jesus Christ, right? What this means is that God gave us the law, the Ten Commandments in the beginning, in the, in the time of Moses, during Moses' dispensation. He gave us the Ten Commandments in order to give us a reflection of his own character. That God is love, and therefore to live with God is to live at peace. God is love. It means when you have a property, he does not want your property. He does not want to steal from you. He does not want to kill you. It's a reflection of God's character. You see, God has practiced what he has told us to do. <laughs> Jesus prayer, remember Jesus prayer in, in, in John 17, he says that they may be one just as you and I are one and they may share in the glory that you and I experienced from the beginning. And he talks about the fellowship they shared, the love they shared from the beginning. So God has experienced what he tells us to do. He has practiced it. He has done it. He's not talking from a point of not having done it. And not only has he experienced and done it, he further came down in form of a human being, Jesus, God in the flesh, 
and experienced and practiced it in the flesh as a man. So the things that God is telling us to do, he has practiced and he has experienced. So when he gave us the law, the law was a reflection of who he is. You know, the commandments were a reflection of who he is, of his character. It's it's not really about the actual deeds, the actual fine details of the deeds that you should and shouldn't do. It's more about the character of the person you're dealing with, the, the, the personality, the nature of the person you're dealing with. That is revealed in God's law. Now, God did not give us the law in order for us to become a reflection of the law or a reflection of himself by the law. But what he did was in order to mirror ourselves, to see how far we are from God's character, for God to distinguish himself from us. So God gave the law in order to distinguish himself from us. And when he gave that law and we saw that we can't manage, he then sent Jesus Christ to fulfill that law on our behalf, right? That's why Jesus says, I did not come to do away with the law. Why? Because the law is the nature of God. I did not come to change God's nature or the nature God has revealed to you, but I've come to fulfill, to show you that only one man can really fulfill God's nature. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ performed. He worked. He lived. He executed God's nature as a man. Wow. And so this satisfied the requirement for the justice that was required by God. So God has what he calls the mercy seat, which requires justice for every wrong done. Okay. So when Adam and Eve sinned, there was justice required, not only on Adam, but on his race, because the Bible says, and God created, um, a man in his image, male and female, he created them and he called his name Adam. So it means when God created Adam, he had already created Eve and he had created you and I, but we were all inside Adam. Now, when we came out of Adam, we shared in his nature, his body and his spirit. That's why we're all born, we're all born sinners. The one thing we at least got to have is a living soul. We are living souls, so our souls can learn. But we inherited the body from Adam. We inherited the spirit from, from Adam, just as he inherited both the body and spirit from God because the earth came from God. Now, um, in light of all this, because Adam sinned, the rest of humanity who came out of him came out sinners. And so... The mercy seat of God was requiring judgment. It was, it was requiring justice because God is merciful and he is just and he is holy. And all these are attributes of God that cannot be ignored. Uh, you know, for, for example, if you get into water today, your nature, your body will reject that environment and give it a few minutes, you'll die. So think of that as God's holiness. It's his nature. It's not like something, it's not like a way he's unwilling to change. No, it's his nature. If you hold your breath, you die. So God cannot, you know, seclude his holiness. But then there is a contrast to his nature, his love. So in order to satisfy the justice that was required for the sin of Adam, God had to bring a substitution, a substitution who was going to pay the price for every man. Now, in order to, 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 to satisfy this, Jesus had to execute the very nature of God. Not only that, he had to die and incur all the sicknesses on his body, incur all the pain on his body, and also got to hell. And when Jesus went to hell, he satisfied the wrath of God. But in hell, he also preached because in order for the gospel to be transmitted, it needs to be preached and accepted. You need to confess with your mouth. Okay, now, we've gotten past that. Jesus Christ became the substitute. He fulfilled the law on our behalf. And now he says, whoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. So when we believe in Jesus, we have satisfied a legal requirement. We have stood behind him. 
such that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus first. So in the Lamb's book of life, that is the Jesus Christ's book of life, but our names are inside his book. Remember, we all have books. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, Psalm 139, I believe it says, all your days he wrote in his book before he fashioned you. So you have a book. But the, the secret is not to be written in your own book. It's to be written in the Lamb's book, in Christ's book, in Jesus' book, because Jesus satisfied the requirement. So does Jesus know you? If Jesus knows you, he writes your name in his book like, ah, this one, we know each other. I've saved him. That's why it's Jesus who will say, get away from me. I never knew you. That's the whole idea. So the idea is not what you do, how you live. No, it's in believing in Jesus. All these things come after. Now, in order to understand this, or rather in order to benefit from the kingdom of God, you need to understand this legal procedure. That as long as it comes to my standing with God, I have full access. I have, that's why a murderer can take out his gun and shoot someone, kneel down and pray, and God will hear. I'm not saying God will, ex will exempt him from the consequences of what he's done, You'll still go to jail. <laughs> but God will listen. So we have full access to God. We are in right standing with God, not because of ourselves, because there's nothing, nothing we can do to satisfy the requirement, to satisfy God's righteousness. We can't meet up to that standard. So Jesus did it on our behalf. Now, when you understand this doctrine of righteousness, when you understand this legal standing, this legal position that Jesus Christ has put in, that Jesus Christ has put us in, then you have understood the doctrine of righteousness. And when you understand the doctrine of righteousness, you graduate to strong meat. Because the problem is that many Christians today are trapped in their sin. The Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over me, for I am under grace and not under the law. Understand that statement. What is Paul saying exactly when he says, sin shall not have dominion over me? You see, sin works with a tool. Sin works with a tool. And it reminds me of Jesus' words. When Jesus says, uh, if an evil spirit is cast out of a body and he comes back and finds it clean and swept and it is not occupied, he will go and fetch seven more wicked than himself. This is because sin, depending on the sin you're committing, can use this one tool to a greater extent. There are certain sins that make use of this tool to a less extent, and there are certain sins that make use of this tool to a greater extent, and the tool is called condemnation. That's why the Holy Spirit says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's in the book of Romans. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is because condemnation, that tool that sin uses, has no power over you. Now, if you do not understand the doctrine of righteousness, that is where sin gets you. It gets you on condemnation. Then it short circuits your growth. Because in order to grow in the kingdom of God, you need to consistently keep walking, keep walking, keep traveling, keep ascending, keep ascending, keep ascending. When you sin, you have an advocate. Keep ascending, keep ascending. When you sin, you have an advocate. That's in the book of John, first John rather. It says, uh, and if, we, if you sin, we have an advocate, the man. Jesus. And it says, and God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you need to understand that if you commit sin, but you're born again, we have an advocate. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive, right? But what you need to do is keep working. Because for some of you, sin has short-circuited your spiritual life because of your guilt, because of your condemnation. So you committed a sin and, to, and you decide not to pray on that day. And because you decided not to pray, it kind of invites a sin more wicked than itself, which will give you a greater amount of condemnation. And so it extends into the week. You don't pray that week because condemnation has hit you hard. And when condemnation has hit you hard and you don't pray that week, your, 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 your spirit is unoccupied. Your body is unoccupied. Okay. 
The more you pray, the more your body is occupied. The more you study the word, the more you expose yourself to the presence of God, the more your body is occupied. And so demons cannot occupy it. But once you commit a sin, condemnation kicks in, you cut off prayer, you cut off fellowship with God, you become empty. And that particular sin you committed, which invited condemnation, and used it as a tool to steer you away from the kingdom of God. That sin invites seven more sins, more wicked than themselves. Because these sins are expressions of spirits. They are expressions of demons. You understand? So there are two ways to deal with these things. Number one, you resist and he will flee. How do you resist? You resist by ignoring. Number two, you mortify your members. The Bible says mortify. This is where you, <laughs> you ignore the desire to the point of its death. Like fasting. Have you ever gone on a, on a prolonged fast? Let's say you're doing a 21-day fast or a 40-day fast or however many days you have gone for. On day one, day two, day three, up to day seven, it may be the hardest thing you have ever experienced in your life. But once you get to day 14, it feels like your body has acclimatized. You have mortified your member. Okay, so if you can get past condemnation, by understanding the doctrine of righteousness, you will see the kingdom of God. You will experience the kingdom of God. Every born again believer should see the kingdom of God, should experience the kingdom of God. But you're not experiencing the kingdom of, kingdom of God because it's a bridge you're failing to cross. So understanding the doctrine of righteousness is very essential in advancing in your spiritual walk with God. And when you're advancing your spiritual walk with God, that's so beneficial. Because you, remember, you're a citizen of two kingdoms. Your spirit man, who is seated in heavenly places with Christ, must be in contact with you who's here on earth. <laughs> you understand? By the way, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share. To conclude, the doctrine of righteousness is an introductory lesson an elementary teaching in the kingdom of God. And once you have understood where you stand with God, that with God, it's not about what you're doing, the secrecy of your bedroom. It's about the legality of what Christ did. That plays a part. It does. It plays a part. Because as long as you keep engaging in what you're doing, <laughs> you are always going to be under subjection to this too called condemnation because it has different forms of hitting you, different ways of hitting you. You are giving room to the enemy to accuse you. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren, whom they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. All right. Once again, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that notification bell and share. I hope you're enjoying Bible talks so far. And um, I hope you're following catch the show on Monday. We'll be here with uh, my co-host Chofia and bye for now. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.